from the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. Their soon-to-be Wonder Woman, Vicki Fisher. Our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scripchuk. And our Batman, the master of tools, gadgets, and all things mechanical, our mild-mannered soon-to-be billionaire, Alan Danvers. Their mission, to fight injustice, share what is right and wrong, to get you out of your house and come out racing with them, and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. Welcome to the Garage Heroes in Training Podcast. I am the only host tonight because everybody else is running around like crazy people. We have a returning guest. He uh, routinely beats us at every race we've ever been at, which is two so far, but you know, two for two counts. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? He is the youngest person that I know who still has an AOL email account. We'll talk about that at some point. And uh, he has some pretty important announcements, and we thought we'd bring him back. With that, we have Kyle Lockrow back to the podcast. Welcome, Kyle. Hi, Bill. Hey, everybody out there in podcast land. How are you doing that's, this evening? That's right. You're assuming we have listeners. I like that. We're starting with the positive yeah. thoughts. That's awesome. Absolutely. We have tons of listeners, hundreds tons of, of listeners. listeners. I'm fending them off by, at the moment. They're just <clears throat> coming up to the uh, podcast studio. No. Anyway, sir, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. Last time I saw you, you were uh, you were taking home some hardware at a uh, event that we went to that was fantastic. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh of all places, CMP, a place where I don't have a ton of seat time, and it was honestly a last-minute decision to even come down there. Mm -hmm. um, we had just decided to do VIR the week. Uh, we were doing that the week after, and we had, I think we were in Daytona the week before. I was spotting the ARCA race for a teammate, and it was Wednesday, and I was like, let me see if they have a seat open. And next thing we know... We're winning the race in the pouring rain in class on Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a shot at it on Saturday until the shifter broke. So, which I think is an omen with me because that's the second time I've been in an event and that same shifter's app broken. I believe that uh, one of our teammates, Ryan, has fixed your shifter for the last time. That thing, if it breaks now, it, I mean, it's going to have to crack through a, uh, a socket yeah. that was turned into a a bridging piece of metal and uh, i don't think you're gonna he, make that one anymore no he did a great job that thing shifted like butter on sunday it was awesome and yeah i think um i think what is it he called um we were in the group message and andy said um why did that shifter break because i raced with a bunch of something something champions that's right yeah. and you did Exactly. You know what else? You get you get brownie points and extra credit because you were silly enough to go to a parts run for our car the night before the victory, which is greatly appreciated. We did not get to take advantage of it, but it was greatly appreciated. It Anytime. I knew, well, I, you guys had worked your butts off all, all weekend to get that car out there. I mean, you were fast. If that thing had stayed together, you guys would have been up there contending for a victory and you deserve to get a chance down there out there. And just like we always talk about in racing, I mean, yeah, we're out there on the track to beat each other and we want to be competitive, but just like when we're off track, we're all friends. We all want to see each other be successful and have fun. And there's no reason why we shouldn't have gone to get it. You guys deserve as much of a chance to get out there as we do. It's like, it's like when I was a kid, cause I was, I grew up an only child. Cause you know, once you, once you start with this, uh, my parents, you know, the, the, the positive thing is, you know, where could you go from here? And the negative thing is, oh my God, it could get worse than this. But anyway, <laughs> um, it, when you got to play with a kid in the neighborhood, it was always, you know, I used to poke at them and pick at them to try to get their best game. Cause it was so rare for me mm -hmm. to have somebody to, to play with. It could be basketball or whatever. You wanted their best game to see where you were, and it's the same thing with racing. You don't want to beat us because we can't get out of the pit. You want to beat us head-to-head, -head, out on the track, mm -hmm. dicing it up, seeing who wins, seeing who loses. It doesn't really matter so much. It's the it's the journey, not the end, right? Right. No, I, I completely agree with you. It's You don't want to beat somebody. It's a lot of times, not that a win isn't a win, but beating somebody on technicality. Mm-hmm or some type of circumstantial isn't always as fun as beating them heads up. 
and yep. just racing, seeing who had the better car, who was the better driver that day, or who might have had the advantage of that track or with the time of day. I mean, we could go on and on, but just yeah. that's the perfect scenario to beat a guy. But technicalities, it, it, not that it's a gimme, but it's like, man, you wonder what if. Yeah, and you, you, the closer to racing, the better. I mean, that's, you know, if exactly. you could go down the, the – the final turn and your neck and neck that would be just mm -hmm. spectacular so anyway so what did you think of cmp you said you hadn't been there very often no i'd only been there i think i'd only been there once uh that was the third time i'd been there and the previous two times once was a test at ironically a term one day which i instructed on friday mm -hmm. um one of the our race bar friends Anne couldn't make it so she asked me to fill in last minute and and you really enjoyed working with that club they're a lot of fun mm -hmm. and we tested in that event last year and got a few laps didn't get a much because a lot of guys had some offs and then went back with race bar in august and we had a good run um we were pretty competitive there got used to the track it was ungodly hot that day so it was a lot of heat that was that really tested my stamina but it was nice to go back really get into a rhythm um, I really think we had a shot at podium both days if we hadn't have had the mechanical on Saturday, but Sunday really just worked out. I mean, we knew we weren't the fastest car, but we knew we were a top three car and the weather really just played into our favor and just everybody drove great. I mean, Andy, Jeff, Myron, everybody just was so consistent and it just, it worked out for us. So, uh, Rumor has it that you uh, you got your money's worth out of those brake pads. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I didn't know this. Andy kept saying, "Oh, we don't have any brakes. Oh, we don't have any brakes." I'm thinking, okay, we've we've got to have at least something. I mean, the car is somewhat slowing down, and I'm thinking, I figured he was amped up, and I'm like, ah, we got to have we got to have something. And I got in the car, and it, I mean, it would slow down and I'm thinking, okay, it's probably just, I know we're getting to the end. I'm starting to hear a little bit. I'll just, I mean, we were a bit slower in the weather. So we knew, I knew if I just backed off and just eased up, it wasn't too bad, but um, it was getting a little questionable at the end, but I still had a pedal. So I figured, okay, we're just right at the end of the pads. Uh, apparently I was metal to metal for the last hour. And I got a picture on the group from Jeff and Andy that it was in two pieces once they took it off the car. So I guess I was a very lucky man. Yep, yep. It's a good thing it was rainy day. Yeah, and that was probably the only thing that kept it cool. So race bar, next time you're at the race and it's like, should we change a pad or shouldn't we change a pad? The correct <laughs> answer the is exactly, exactly. Change the freaking pad. <laughs> So since you get some hardware on a rainy day at CMP, we thought we'd talk a little bit about, since you're a racing coach and professional racing driver, which we'll talk about more, we thought we'd talk about racing in the rain. What do you, what do you use your typical um, thought process and methodology for figuring out where and how to run in the rain and where the limits are for that particular day and car combo? It honestly depends on what kind of car you've got, what kind of track you're at, what the track conditions are. Really, it's a trial by fire kind of thing. You kind of have to get out there and you got to light the tires up a little bit and really see what kind of wheel spin you've got to get the car turned or to get the car moving. Mm -hmm. You need to know how much water is out there, where the standing water is to avoid it. Obviously, rule one, racing in the rain on a road course, you tend to run a bit offline. Mm -hmm. Ironically, though, CMP was very favorable to running most of the online. It wasn't as bad. There were a couple sections you had to run about a half a lane left or right, give or take the water amount and just what, what the track condition had at that time. But it was, um, it was a challenge. Plus, we didn't have a wiper. So... Uh, the, I mean, Andy and all the guys and Myron and Jeff, I mean, we all worked really hard to make sure we anti-fogged the crap out of that window and made sure that we put good rain X on it and coated it a couple of times. We wanted to make sure because we knew we were at a disadvantage with no wiper. So mm -hmm. we did the best we could with it. But really for me, it was learning the track, understanding it and just making sure I started out really smooth and just 
got my confidence up. I don't have a ton of racing experience in the rain, to be perfectly honest with you. The first time I ever did it was 2017 at Watkins Glen, but that was a more damp track with um, just kind of like misting all day and then lighter rain. So it wasn't what we had at CMP. And then the second time I really got some time in the rain was Daytona two years ago, the race that we'll have this weekend. And that was an unexpected rain. It was one of those Florida thunderstorms that popped up and it went from a dry track in a 90 plus degree day. And the track already had all the fluid on top of it. And then when the water hit, I mean, everybody, even some of the best cars, we were all sailing off in the grass. So Mm -hmm. what I took from, and that was frustrating for me because I always felt like I, I wanted to be good in the rain. I know it's important in road racing. So my goal at CMP was just figure out what kind of wheel spin I had in race bar, whether I needed to be a gear up, same gear I was in in the corners based on wheel spin and just being smooth, letting the car roll the corners. Obviously, you have to attack traffic a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So really, it's just taking it one corner and one lap at a time because where you see turn the sweeping section in the back maybe good one lap you get a little bit of extra rain that hits that section then boom you're gonna you got to adjust your line and you're driving next lap so it all changes right and and the uh the interactions become trickier because you're Mm -hmm. you're it's good when you're racing with somebody that you're comfortable with or somebody that you know or somebody that you've run for a while with but when the when new people get in the car it's like you know got to relearn who who's out there with me and see what we can do and that was the consensus most of the weekend we knew the forecast for one of the days was going to be questionable and saturday was good but i remember hearing a lot of drivers that had never been in the rain right excuse me never been in the rain before so for them it was the unknown so that makes it even worse because they don't know how to drive in the rain i had a few people actually come up to me. I don't know if somebody told him I'd had some seat time in the rain or overheard a conversation, but a couple of people came up and said, Hey, do you have any advice for driving in the rain? And I just kind of told them, be patient. You know, sometimes a third gear corners, a fourth gear, third, second gear, or third gear corners, you know, fourth seconds and third, et cetera, adjust yourself accordingly, but don't go out and expect to have the maximum grip because you're not going to have it. So mm-hmm. actually a couple of us, um, Michael, I think Sullivan, he was with the pink Volvo and his wife, uh, she was racing for one of the first times. We Mike knew Ed that worked at CMP and actually we negotiated with Ed to use old cones because we knew with the lack of sight through the fog and the rain that a lot of people were going to struggle not being able to see and they needed markers since they had taken the signs down. Yep. And Kathy was doing it to make sure people didn't get charged, which completely right decision. But at the same time, we needed something. So Ed agreed to use some old cones that were essentially, if they got destroyed, they got destroyed. And we actually went out and coned part of the course. And a lot of people said that really helped. So as far as the coaching, having a visual of a bright color in the rain actually made the difference for a lot of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a lot of people didn't even race that day. I mean, there was probably eight or nine, if I remember right, teams that didn't even go out and, you know. Mm -hmm it's the the amount you can learn on a rainy track is is so much uh of so much value to you as a driver i I think the people who choose not to do it are making a a a mistake in terms of their driving progression i agree i think that it's something you have to it's a trial like i said earlier it's a trial by fire bill it's not something i mean yes obviously doing it in a practice session is much more ideal than doing it in competition sure. but it's not the simulation is not the same having to do it in a competitive nature kind of forces you to figure it out it forces you to to test your driving ability and see where you are it's a good way to where do you stack up as a driver at this mm-hmm. point in your driving career mm-hmm and uh you know as far as as our team goes the the trickier spots for us aren't necessarily driving in the rain or driving in the dry it's the transitions either towards being a wet track or coming from a wet track that are that are trickier 
Um, is that something you've seen or? Oh yeah. Um, Daytona two years ago was a prime example when it went from completely dry and the humidity in the air. I mean, the track was hotter than blazes, all the fluid and oil and water and whatnot was on top of the racetrack. Cause it was 90 plus with humidity that day in Daytona. Mm. And then that storm came in and it dropped. I mean, the humidity spiked, but the temp dropped a little bit. It was a cold rain that came in and it just made the track completely undrivable. Now that's an extreme situation where you went from a slick dry track to an absolutely torrential down, down, you know, down port infield in, in Daytona, which is already very slick to start with. The banking was fine, but the international horseshoe was sketchy. Turn the West horseshoe was sketchy. And there was a little bit of standing water in six coming back onto the banking. I mean, the banking's fine. Once you get up there and you're rolling, you're good. But the bus stop, you had to even be very, very careful. It's just that place with its nature and sand and things of like that, you got to be real careful. So that, like you said, that transition and having to adjust every corner, it catches a lot of drivers off guard because where one lap or next corner, you can drive it decent speed you may have to completely back off and roll through a corner that potentially could have standing water or has zero to no grip regardless of what rain tire you're on it's just you're at the mercy of the weather and the track mm -hmm. and then um the other thing we like to do uh, i don't know if you you try to do it as well but um we'll tend to experiment a little more like when you get to decent at track driving you you kind of hit the line and do the line and only get off the pass but if it gets wet we'll start like looking for something with some grip and it, mm -hmm. you know it could be you know if it's a uh you know the typical outside in out trajectory through a turn it may go all the way like mid ohio we'll go all the way to inside full outside full inside do it exactly mm -hmm. backwards just trying to find something that you could you could get a grip on with those tires and um did you guys need to do that at all when you were at cmp a little bit i can't speak for andy jeff and myron i don't know exactly because i mean it's so flat you can't it's kind of hard to tell what they're doing especially on the hidden part of the course mm -hmm. but from my standpoint i knew you had to adjust slightly um turn i think it's 14 the final corner coming down the front stretch i would mm -hmm. run about a half lane left Okay. just because it would keep away from the strip because obviously rule number one, another rule don't touch the paint because that's yeah, the worst thing is, you can do too but you, you just had to adjust much i mean cmp i think with the cooler temperatures it was a little easier there wasn't all the junk on the racetrack that there would mm -hmm. be when it's really hot but there were a couple corners you had to adjust and then the kink had some standing water and was very slick so you just needed to let the car float through there really it, it changes so like you said it's almost kind of like doing a doing a drill in basketball or, or um, football you have to you kind of have to make those adjustments and practice running offline you have to force yourself to run in sketchy situations and figure out how to make it work because sometimes that can be where the speed is in the wet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you do anything as far as or do you do or do you recommend your students do anything as far as their vision goes when it's wet because we typically see our drivers as the vision you know sometimes it's foggy or misty and your vision starts to go down you'll get a little lazy with your eyes and bring them down a little bit or you know just um for some reason people get a little more concerned and start bringing their eyes down and, and i'm thinking that's the exact opposite of what you need to do yeah you you, you tend to, because you're, I think it scares people because, and I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong. No. Um, I think to your point, yeah, you get lazy, but I think it's a fear Could be. is what makes you lazy. And the reason I say that is when I was looking straight ahead in traffic, I'm looking at rooster tails and potential brake lights. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that you can't see anything, people get lazy because they bring their eyesight down just over the hood because they can still see the racetrack but mm -hmm. the problem is you got to be looking ahead of you at the corner for a stopped car you've got to be looking to see the cars ahead and i think it's fear makes you lazy and the and the unknown makes you lazy because you can't see it so you always want and we no matter what program i'm with whether it's exotic cars or hpdes whatever you're always making sure those students regardless of it's dry, wet, 
a mix of both. You always want them keeping those eyes up because things can happen in a split second. And also, too, I always try to make sure people don't drive off the car in front of them. Mm -hmm. That is something in the wet where a lot of people will want to drive off the car in front because they see brake lights. You have to just trust your ability, adjust yourself accordingly in your shifting and your braking and how you drive the car. Drive within your limits and the car's limits, but don't drive off the car in front of you because that will be what gets in trouble. Because if that car goes off, you're going off. You have to run your line, take advantage of their mistakes and hiccups. And that's where you make passes. And that's what I tried to do at CMP that summer. Yeah. The, the other thing we, we try and do when I'm trying to instruct, uh, not at the level that you do it, but you know, when I'm trying is, you know, there's certain points in the track where you can kind of peek around the corner or mm-hmm. see another section, you know, just try and get as, even though the, the rain or the mist or the rooster tails limit your vision directly in front of you. If you can peek off to the side, sometimes you can see something. And sometimes it could be one of your friends going pirouetting down the track, but you know, <laughs> at least you'll know it's coming. And you'll, you'll at least you can give him a nine five on the radio. Exactly. Give him a nice beep yep, beep exactly. when you go by, you know, you know, yep. it's fun. So try and try and get as much vision as you can. Just, you know, search for it, I guess is what we try to do. And that's a good point you brought up because that's something that I noticed. And the minute you said that, I realized that's what I did. And regardless of the level, I mean, yes, I have the pro experience, but you guys have a ton of experience. And regardless if you're amateur, semi-pro, professional, it's your first day or, you're, or you've been doing this for a hundred years, you always want to be looking around. You want to get the peripheral of what's around you. You want to do that scan of mm-hmm. the mirrors and around you and making sure everything's okay. And what I like to do is even in the dry, I like to take to have markers. And that's, I think, what helped me at CMP. It's having little markers. It's find something in the trees, find something on the guardrail, find something and make mental notes of where they are. If in the dry, that's the 500 marker. That little indicator is not going to move, but you'll know, okay, well, I saw that piece of that little bit of paint on the guardrail. That's the 500 marker that I need to start rolling into the brakes. That's where I was, or I need to do it a little bit before it. And you find those different markers around the racetrack and that's what makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And it's that overall track awareness. And sometimes when you can't see, you have to drive to the side, like you're saying, and look for those indicators to tell you where you are on the racetrack. It's essentially like driving blind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it does help. I mean, the, the, the game I play, cause I don't get to go on track as much as I would love to go on track every single day. I just can't. Um, <laughs> when I'm driving on the street, even if it's, you know, back roads or, you know, if you're in a grid, there's only so much you can do, but if it's a, if it's a back road, I'm playing a game with myself, trying to see as much as I can, as far as I can. And if there's a car in front of me, all the better, because I I need to be able to see around them and what they're doing in front of me really doesn't impact me from a focus perspective. It impacts me from a peripheral perspective. I try to see, and get as much information as I can. A, it helps with Mr. Policeman. He sometimes doesn't like the way I drive. I don't know if I've ever had that problem. But, uh, you know, just, you know, try to see as much as I can and get as much information as I can because information is power. Oh, no, you're right. And to your point about the police officer, I love them, respect everything they do. But, you know, they play this unfair game where they want to race you. And then when they're mad, they get mad, you're beating them. They turn their lights on and it's game over. Did you ever notice... They always complain that you're going too fast, but they caught you. So they were going they, faster. Why can't we give them a ticket for going faster than our ticket? I want to know. You know, that's a, that is a really good question. I have some people I know that are police officers. My father is a former police officer. Mm-hmm. That is a question I should raise just for the sake of argument because, yeah, yeah we could technically we could make we could do a citizen pullover and give them a ticket. I mean, whatever I was public. doing, he went faster to catch me. Right. I mean, you know anyway you, you make a good point you know sir you could be a good lawyer well you never know you never know i remember this one time i got pulled over when i was in college we were driving up the cornell uh dropping a friend off and the policeman pulls me over and he's like do you know how fast you were going and i could honestly say no because my speedometer at the time it was an 84 firebird it went up to 85 and i have no idea how fast i was going he said 72 i was like sold great i'll take that <laughs> yeah i have no idea how fast i was going but whatever anyway hey. So, sir, we're very excited. We have something almost tentatively scheduled. I think we'll go with pencil right now, where you 
and our team will be... Captain's Log Supplemental. Once you start racing, you'll start to know that the more information your driver can have, the better. One of the things that we've found is that the Sentinel system allows you to be able to not only get your driver the information that they need, but also be able to share the information with the pit and anybody who's got internet availability. You can integrate your AIM data. You can integrate the driver tag, as in who is the driver in the car. You can also integrate in your standings and who is ahead or behind of you into the dash, as well as be able to see flag statuses in case there's a yellow flag or a red flag or a black flag. Hopefully none of those, but uh, they do happen. This was developed by a fellow racer, former guest, James Candelaria, and uh, he is uh, seeing a lot of people using it in the SCCA, WRL, AER, and we are doing demos at our paddocks whenever we are at the track. It could be at a race or it could be at an HBD. If you're interested and want to come in and see how it is, we can give you a demo. And if you find that it's something that would be helpful to your racing, please use our discount code, which will save you 10% on anything that you buy. And it is uh, creatively GHIT, G-H-I-T for garage heroes and training. So hopefully you will find that the uh, Sentinel system is as useful for your racing as we have found it for ours. Uh, having one of our first ever coaching at a track event with I'm you. I'm excited about it. it I really am. Fantastic. I, I'm looking forward to working with you guys. I I appreciated it. It meant a lot to me that you guys reached out and we were able to finally coordinate for something. Because I, I want to learn from you guys. I want to see what you're doing. I mean, I, you no matter what situation. I see what's going yeah. on. <laughs> honestly i want to see what you guys are doing too because any situation that i get in there's things that i can learn there's little nuances or little things that i can mm -hmm. pick up to make myself better but i really want to help you guys get better i want to pass along some of the knowledge and make the learning curve much less steep for you guys than it was for me so i i want to i want to help that because i know you guys are going to pay it back or pay you know forward to the next yep. group that comes in so i mean it's it's for a good cause and it'll be fun it will be fun I, I can't wait to do it so so when you're when we're looking at your coaching with you which you do for others as well what would typically be kind of the preparation before we get to the event that you would like to do with your clients Honestly, the biggest thing pending what their situation would be would be to do a virtual session just mm -hmm. to get familiar with the track on iRacing if possible. Mm -hmm. It just, in my mind, the hand-eye coordination never hurts, just staying sharp there. But really getting the visual of the track environment in the virtual setting makes it easier because then when you get there, you have an understanding, okay, this looks familiar in turn one, this... Uh, you crest before you get to seven or whatever the case mm -hmm. is you understand your facility before you get there. Yes. You don't feel everything because you may not have a motion simulator or there might be some slight changes that since the last time the place was scanned, but you have an 80 to 90 percentile view po um, positive view of what you're getting yourself into. So it really, mm -hmm gives you a little confidence going into the day. Okay, I have an idea. Now let's put the rest of the pieces of the puzzle together. So would that be your preparation for the track or would that be you watching your student on the track in in iRacing type settings or, or both or? Both. Both. Um, okay. Both, because it lets the student build the confidence to understand the facility. It lets me kind of see if they have any type of erratic tendencies. It lets me see if they're tentative in certain sections. It kind of lets me see where they're struggling if we're doing a lead follow on a simulator. Mm -hmm. Whether And what I like to do when I worked with, um, I'll give you an example, a teammate of mine, Nick Grossman. I raced uh, once or twice with him in Champ Car. He races NASA and does some events. He, I helped him get ready for Daytona and was helping him last year get ready for Watkins Glen. But due to mechanical, we didn't go to that race, at least with the team that we originally planned. So what I did with Nick is just pulled him around the Glen, pulled him around Daytona, showed him the line. I said, okay, you know, you got to watch the bumps here in six onto the transition, mm -hmm. getting onto the banking. You got to be real careful in these sections. People will dive bomb you. You got to be really careful. Cause I didn't know if he was in a, pointed passing session in NASA if he was an open passing. So I just wanted to prepare him for the best and prepare him for the worst. And that's really what I would want to do with anybody is just 
see how they handle certain situations. At Watkins Glen, we were in Miatas where we could actually use the shifter. For me, that helped. But I would actually not tell Nick and going into the bus stop where a lot of guys tend to drive in hard. I actually, at the last second, threw the car in there and grazed him on the side and try intentionally pushed him offline and said, and he it, he's he's kept the car straight and got back on the track. And I heard him on the mic go, whoa. And I said, and I said, you just passed, I said you passed one of the tests. I said, that is the one of the biggest things you have to watch for at Watkins Glen. Our guys are going to try to outbreak you into the bus stop. One, because they're trying to prove something. And two, they don't know any better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what else you need to do at Watkins Glen? Avoid the What's blue that? bushes. Avoid exactly. The They're bushes. nasty bushes. They're like briar bushes. They are. They're, they might even be worse. I don't know. But the, uh, I, Yeah, they, they're expensive, too. They are. They're, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a very, very expensive bush. They are. Uh, both, both for the bush and for your car. Um, exactly. Double the but, expense, less the fun. I know. No fun whatsoever. <laughs> Unless you like blue stripes on your car. It's, I can think of. I like ways. Darlington stripes. I don't like blue stripes. Okay, all right. I get, I get you. I'm, I'm feeling that. <laughs> okay, so we so we've done a little pre prep. We probably have our our, our uh, coach and driver meetings ahead of time. Um, let's let's just use us as a model. We're going to have Jennifer, who's um, probably the the youngest of our uh, driving experience she's she's been on a track the least of the three people she's working her way up she just got promoted to hpd3 with nasa good for her. So, so good for her uh vicky who's an hpd3 but should have been there a long time ago but vicky wasn't going until vicky thought she was ready screw the rest of us don't worry about the instructors none of us know what's going on she'll let us know when we're right <laughs> Uh, so, so she's she's pretty confident in her abilities and she's doing quite well. And then you've got me, who's you know working on. Uh, I got comp school coming up. I got some racing coming up. Hopefully, we'll be uh, getting together. So you kind of get the the assortment. Hopefully, you won't come away from this saying, "Wow, they really shouldn't be driving anything even on the road." <laughs> That's not the goal. But you're going to kind of get a, a, a variety of people to work with. Is that going to be difficult for you, or is that going to be something that? Um, just changes your weekend or we know we'll be entertaining because you know i think one thing we'll, we're expecting to hear from you is wow i've never seen anybody do it wrong that way before but you know that's kind of <laughs> to be honest with you with what i've done so far because i've actually just got officially approved to instruct in nasa i got my full nasa license in instructing license a couple of weeks ago at vir Nice. And actually, I got my check ride for TT on the same weekend, so I'm approved to do the TT stuff in NASA mm -hmm. too. I just wanted that on my resume if I got to do it. That was kind of a bucket list thing, so that was cool personally for me. But honestly, it's not something that would phase me because I've worked with multiple students at multiple levels on the NASA weekends. But with the instructing I do through extreme experience and when I've worked with the petty experience and NASCAR mm -hmm. race experience in turn one, I've worked with a variety of different drivers, folks that have never been on a racetrack. I've coached guys that can't drive a stick shift through a radio in NASCAR up through the gears and onto the racetrack, which okay, multiple times. And that was by luck at Dover, thank God. And, um, so really I welcome the challenge because it lets me kind of see what my ability is, where, Mm -hmm. what do I need to do to get them to where they want to go or where can I get them to be safe? Where can I get them to be productive and where, and how can I show them they're probably better than they think they are. And mm -hmm. I want to, it challenges me as an instructor to say, okay, I, I see what I'm working with. I see what I can mold, where I can mold this and take it and make it into something. And that's kind of what I did with one of my students in NASA so far. Um, he, he started very erratically, just very tentative on a lot of things. Within a weekend, I smoothed them out. Didn't didn't yell at him, didn't harp on him. The biggest thing I did is first session, I said, okay, Steve, get in the car. I'm not going to say much. All I want you to do is drive this first session. You don't know me. I don't know you. You show me what you're doing. Let me take some mental notes and then we'll figure it out from there. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And he showed me what he did. We talked about it afterward. And throughout the weekend, we just started molding it. And then the next weekend, and now he's an HBD too. 
and he's doing really well. It's an adjustment and he's going to continue to progress up when he's ready. He wanted to go last year. And I said, no, let's do another weekend. I think you're there, but you need some more seat time. I always encourage more seat time. I would rather a student, especially like in when you're talking about with Vicky's case, she said she wasn't ready. I applaud her for that because you know, it takes a lot for a student to not be peer pressured into going to a higher HPDE level. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot for them to say, you know what, I'm not ready. And I want to sit and I want to stay put. And I would rather them do that and then get into it rather than get into a situation where they're uncomfortable and then they mm -hmm. get hurt or somebody else gets in an accident sure. or cars get hurt rather than stay in, learn a little bit more, give yourself another weekend, build the confidence, then make the jump. Well, I obviously think Vicky did everything right, so there's no choice in that matter. But the, the only reason that we were saying uh, that she was – we were saying she was ready and she could go whenever she wanted is she had an incomplete data set and in that she didn't know what the HPD3 was with the group that she was running with. And I mm -hmm. think she had them at a level that's – the graduate of HPD three, as opposed to yeah. the entry of HPD three. And she wanted to be at that level to start. And I'm like, you need to, you're ready when you're ready, you're ready, but you're, you know, capability wise, you're ready to go. And that was what we were. Trying so she to had a different mindset. Yes. She, she felt like she needed to be ready to go to four an instructor to yeah. go to three rather than making the leap. And learning from the threes and developing, yes. then making okay, okay, yeah. okay. I, I misunderstood that. I apologize, but no, no, no you're, that makes... you're right. It was just that was. It, I think she had a misinterpretation of what a three needed to be to start, and she thought it was much higher level than she would actually really needed to be in it. And you know, that was something I think with Steve too. He was ready, and I think he knew he was ready for the challenge. But I think I wanted him to maybe the opposite of that a little bit. I wanted him to have the confidence to be mid range, not know he was ready to go to instructor in a sense, mm -hmm. but I wanted him to know, yes, you can compete with those guys. Shoot. You can even compete with those, the guys in the middle range. Right. I wanted him to have the confidence to know you'll jump in there and figure it out. You're a smart driver and you've got good instinct. Mm -hmm. So, but I wanted him to develop it a little bit more and get some more solo time without me in the car to help develop his craft. Because like I told him last weekend, when we worked together, remember, I didn't, I didn't say a whole lot. And I said, remember, you're going to get to a level where I'm not going to be in the car at all. So I need you to start showing me, which he has been sure. and, and Vicky in that sense as well. Show me what you're doing with me sitting there saying nothing. Show me, you know, your perspective, show me, you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Show me, you know, how to negotiate and anticipate the traffic situations and the racetrack and show me, you know, what that car's got and you can feel it. So it's just putting all that together and making it a successful session each time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The the first time I, I heard it referred to in this way was when it was with NASA Great Lakes, but I'm, I'm sure it's not unique to them, is um, they don't just refer to a student as an HPD1 student or an HPD2 or an HPD3. They'll actually talk about your first day and pick a level, let's say HPD2. You're like mm -hmm. a 2.0. And then as you progress, you, you go to like a 2.3 or 2.5 and 2.9, and then you're, you're ready to become a 3.0. And I, I think using that type of methodology or, or terminology, I, I think Vicky was thinking that to be a 3.0 was actually what in our group we would have called like a 3.8, 3.9. And, and she, so she was overly concerned about what she needed to be in order to, to fit into the group because there's some groups that we deal with um, that we go to that, that – um, the debriefs become a uh, finger pointing exercise on, on why you didn't give me a pass by a point by on the turn or blah, 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 blah. Cause you know, I've got 800 horsepower and you're in a Miata. But, so, you know, the usual, it's no fun. No, I had never heard that before. And I don't, that may not be, um, just great lakes. I haven't heard it in mid Atlantic. But it makes sense. And now when you explained it a little bit, that kind of makes sense as to 
the expectation that Vicky wanted of herself and mm -hmm. felt like she needed to have to go. And realistically you can go in as a three Oh three one, but develop it and work your way up to that three, eight, three, nine, and then yep. know, okay, I want to go to four and, or down the road, then graduate to instructor. Sure. So yes, that, that completely makes sense. And actually I am glad you told me that because I think I want to adopt that as well, because that'll help me. That gives me another piece of ammunition to go to my students. So Actually, you just taught me something. Oh, there you go. And it's and it wasn't something not to do. So who knew? It's possible. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's, and it's not. I I think you know you've been instructing for a while. Hell, you've been in driving for a while. It's not a straight. You know, my first time I'm in three. I'm a three zero. My second time I'm a three three. My th third time I'm a three six or a three nine. Mm -hmm. And then I graduate to four. It's not linear. You know. I had a student the last time I was at NJMP uh, a couple weeks ago. First day on track, he only did one of the two days. He had the skills to be an HPD too, but I didn't want to promote him until he had encountered some more errors on track, be they in his car or another car. Just so, you know, typically the speed at HPD 1 is slower than at HPD 2. I wanted him to have the reaction time of the slower speed of HPD 1 to know what to do when I do this or when I do that or when somebody else does this or when he does that or when she does this and see that in an HPD 1 atmosphere as opposed to going to HPD 2 where you're going to go a little bit faster and the mm -hmm. impacts or the, the consequences. consequences could be more significant especially when you're driving you know your street car mm -hmm. and uh he fully understood and i I think he understood what i was trying to say i hope he did and if he's listening that was what i was trying to say i don't know if i said it very <laughs> well on the weekend but but it's good um so sir i hear there's some big news on your side of the world hey, there man. is some big news we are um we are gaining momentum every day this program is growing um it is a small program a lot of people from the outside, it looks like it is a gigantic program. If people only knew what we were doing with the limited resources and the limited amount of staffing, you would say, um, I think people would be pleasantly surprised. Um, we have a new sponsor this weekend that we are bringing into motorsports. It is a brand new business and they're going to be uh, my primary at Daytona for the uh, 10th annual 14 hour Daytona. I think it's Daytona 14, 14 hour enduro at Daytona. I forget the official name of it. With it Champ Car? Career. Yes, with Champ Car this weekend. So it is their essentially Daytona 500 of their series. Uh, triple digit car count, a lot of good teams, a lot of competitive rides. And it's, I mean, it's Daytona. It's the Mecca of motorsports, whether it's two wheel, four wheel, dirt, tricycles, you name it. So. Mm -hmm really excited to bring them in it is moore's automotive sales they are a and recycling thank you um they are the newest um, automotive recycling and used parts retailer there in daytona beach they are just getting rolling um it is the mara davis who uh, her brother is the main owner and operator I'll have to get a name to you later. Um, Tanya Banning, my marketing and management, she has been handling a lot of that. So I haven't really heard a lot about that. So I apologize for the lack of details, but it's in the show notes work... for anybody who needs it. Exactly. Um, we have worked the deal through Mara. She is the main contact that we work with and she has been phenomenal. We are trying to do everything we can for them. So what we're hoping to do and if everything works out, is to have them, I mean, obviously, and actually your situation with the team you worked with at CMP, so thank you, you are teaching me again, sir. Um, when you guys brought in the BMW on the record, on mm -hmm. the flatbed, you gave us an idea to start reaching out to a salvage yard. And what we did is we contacted them and told them this is a good way for you to make some money because teams are always looking for spare parts. And mm -hmm. so they're hoping to, if they can get the staffing, have somebody on standby one, just to be there as a rep for their organization and watch us race. But two, if teams need parts or need vehicles brought to them or parts or need to go get it, 
it's a quick way and it's a good source for teams to get back in the race at Daytona because we all know finding parts on the weekends at a parts store or a salvage yard is not very easy. So no. um, Moore's is going to be the best place for everybody to be able to do it. Well, if even if they they weren't a sponsor of yours, I would offer to them the ability to come to any race that we're at because we, we all know we break stuff when we're racing. So. And that was what we were thinking is we're hoping we wanted to introduce them then to the inside of this with champ car and whatever road racing you're doing with the amateur side, because there is an opportunity to, for them to make some money, but help us as race teams as well. So we figured it would be a good partnership. So we're hoping that we can turn this into something bigger, hopefully with a good result as well. I will be back with Brew Crew Racing again in the number 75 car. Um, they raced a couple weeks ago at NCM. They said everything went really well. A couple more gremlins they worked out, but they said this thing should be a rocket ship at Daytona. Uh, I know they've made some aerodynamic adjustments and upgrades, some mechanical upgrades. So I'm optimistic and really excited to get down there on Friday. And since this is breaking news, we will have all the details in the proper format per our guiding light who's sitting off to the side and is always shy when we do these podcasts, but that's okay. Exactly. Um, so awesome. This just happened really like legitimately a few minutes ago. So awesome. Yep. That, congratulations, sir. Thank you. Yeah. We just finalized everything today and just had it. We'll have an official press release out tomorrow morning to, with more of the highlighted details. So we wanted to give you guys the scoop to be the first one to release it. You guys always take care of me. So we wanted to give you guys that exclusive. All right, we're breaking news, even though the press release, when the time this comes out, will be the day before, but that's okay. Shh, but don't tell anybody. I won't. Don't, trust me. Most people don't get press releases anyway, but that's okay. <laughs> so that's awesome. Fantastic. Sir, you know what? You know what would be even better? What's up? If you guys like did some like charity-type events, perhaps. You know, you must be reading my mind, sir, because we oh, actually really? have a we re, yeah you you do you have a crystal ball sitting on the other side of that screen? No, but I got a Google Doc that tells me what my next topic was, so I'm just you know. oh okay, that's even better. <laughs> that's looking right into a crystal ball. Um, we are doing the St. Mary's County Easter Egg Hunt next weekend. So for me, it's where I uh, live locally here in Southern Maryland. It's a friend of mine that actually works for the county brought the idea to me and asked if I would be a part of it, wanted to help me promote myself, but also give back to the kids. And it's a popular event. A lot of people now that the COVID restrictions have dropped and everybody can get out and do things again, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to go, get some local exposure and have some fun. But the cool thing we're gonna do, we were asked to bring the iRacing simulator and we're gonna have that so people can see what it's like to drive a virtual NASCAR race car. Ooh. That sounds awesome. I've got an idea for you. We'll talk off offline, but that's okay. Well, we're also going to, uh, I forgot to mention this. We're going to, in my, you know, I had this, like this buzzing in my ear. It was my people talking to me. Um, it's good to have people, especially when they're I know it, it's, it's great. I've got great people. She, she saves me and prevents me from looking like a total idiot every day. <laughs> that's, a that's a tough job, sir. It, it really is. I, she does not make <laughs> enough money. She need, I, she deserves so much therapy at the end of the day. Um, anyway, so we are going to make a competition out of it for the younger generations and the older folks that want to have some fun with it. So we won't tell you what's in it, but let's just say you have, we have some Easter egg baskets up for prize to take home. Awesome. That's fantastic. I, I know some people who can, uh, contribute to said baskets if you would like some swag uh we would greatly appreciate that sir oh I, well you know i know a guy he's got swag we're willing to mail well you, well, you know what problem. i'm hearing more buzzing you have your people call my people oh <laughs> well unfortunately my people is me so that's fine no. well we, you we, know what we'll go back to 1997 and do it in aol there we go that's right <laughs> Bing. You do got i have mail, mail? i do I do. You know, when That's you did that, it reminded me from when my parents had arrows years ago. And I remember trying to actually get on the Internet to do things as a kid. And you hear the, mm -hmm. the yep. phone line. You're just imagining it just sounds like a really bad car accident on a racetrack. I think that was the preface to racing in the rain. And and the uh, the first time where children of a certain age 
or teenagers of a certain age uh, learn to hate call waiting because call waiting that little blip blip would kick you right off because yep. that, that exactly that was a terrible terrible thing anyway all right such a fun time in our lives it was and the, the speeds were just so awful but <laughs> that's that's okay um so yes sir if yes. people want to contact you perhaps as a sponsoring opportunity perhaps for uh potential use of your service as a coach or just to see what your schedule is like what the what would be the best way to keep up with you and uh, keep apprised of it and contact you? Well, we have all kinds of social media, Facebook, Instagram. We have, we just recently started TikTok, doing some videos on there. We've got LinkedIn. If you want to reach out to us uh, for any type of marketing or partnership opportunities, we like to promote on there. Let them know what we're doing. We've got Twitch where we stream the iRacing stuff. YouTube channel, Lock Row Racing, has a lot of our stuff on the road courses, ovals, anything we can really put out there. We have the website where you can go. There's forums on there. You can request virtual coaching, spotting, anybody that race teams, amateur that has it. We also have our QR code that um, the buzzing in my ear has sent to you. Oh, um, Anybody fancy. with a – I know. We, we are in the 21st century. We are – Trying to get away AOL. from that AOL image. We're trying to get away from that <laughs> AOL image. We really are. We're, we're trying. It's it's an improvement. We're getting there every day. But in all seriousness, anybody that has a smartphone will pass out the QR code. You can scan it. And it's got everything from the website to the social media. There's the team store where you can go and buy merchandise, all kinds of cool stuff, swag that we've got available for purchase. And also, too, the sponsor we will be doing a QR code for them this weekend to where people can scan it and reach out. And on the QR code, it says, break it, question mark, question mark, reach out and they can help you fix it. You're all fancy now, Mr. AOL. We are. Ooh, look at you. I got more than mail, buddy. I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you have people. <laughs> I know. I think I just cost you about 10 viewers with that comment. So I'm That's sorry. Okay. You're fine. It's good. We're good. The, uh, so not that any uh, of our friends in Champ Car will have any issues with their vehicle while driving on Every the track. Every vehicle stays together for all 14 hours. We exactly. Know. Flat out the whole time. Not a problem. But if they do, they now have a QR code. I don't think I have the technical capability of putting the QR codes into the episode notes. However, when we post on Instagram and Facebook, even I know how to do that. So we'll have those out there for you. And we'll post those, and uh, hopefully we can help some of our friends compete with you and see you down at the Daytona event coming up this weekend. Absolutely. And um, also, too, something kind of cool with the ARCA team fast track racing that I drive for. We are actually doing something kind of cool for some of the University of Northern Ohio kids that work with us. Mm -hmm. We wanted to give them some extra opportunity to get some extra reps over the wall and get some more experience. So we are actually bringing a couple of the kids with us down to the race to get some seat time essentially in their world of wrenching and going over the wall with a couple teams and to let them experience it and some of them have never been to a champ car race and done it so they wanted to see it so it really worked out so we're trying to help develop the next generation and pay back to uh the arca team that's fantastic well if you uh want to keep up with kyle and all his exploits we've I have all the information in the episode notes. And if you need a coach, obviously he'll take you at any level. If he's willing to work with us, he's really willing to work with just about anybody. So uh, take advantage of it. I have those standards. It. Let's do it, people. That's right. He can take you from where you are to where you want to be. It's just a matter of how much you're willing to do to get there. Exactly. Awesome. That should be great, and we can't wait. We'll uh, get that coaching firmed up as far as dates, and uh, hopefully it won't be snowing or freezing or ridiculously cold like it is tonight. Yeah. Good luck with the race, sir. Hopefully the weather is much Thank better you. than it is today, and we will be watching on Race Monitor or Race Hero or whatever we can find. We'll we'll keep up with you. I think they're doing a show on YouTube this week. Cause oh, they're live streaming? Got, I believe so because they've got good service down there. And if uh, Mr. Strong actually we're doing in his podcast tomorrow night. Um, so I will confer with him and have the buzzing in my ear, get back to you or one of us will let you know, um, if they're doing a show or not. So we can pass that along as well. All right. It will be in an episode notes. If it is, we'll be there. 
thank you, sir. You have fun and uh, great luck this weekend and for the rest of the season and every season after. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jennifer, and everybody. Appreciate all of it. No worries. We will let them know you said hi. Appreciate it.